go ahead and get started. Um, nice to see everybody. It's a little crowded, I'm sorry, but we couldn't get the nice big room. Um, I think we have it for the next two workshops. Um, there's some agendas around on the tables. Um, and um, for just a couple of reminders for upcoming important dates. Um, our next workshop after today is on March 25th, and that's about intellectual property and commercialization strategies. Um, just as a reminder, at the top of the agenda, our program is called Coulter College Commercializing Innovation. So just as a reminder, we're all about commercializing technologies so that they get to patients, okay? So that will be an important workshop for you, for you to attend. Um, and then another really important workshop is on April 1st. And I'm bringing in a, a very good consultant that I've done probably four of these um, Coulter College boot camps with um, to talk about your killer experiment. What is the key thing that you need to do to attract investment to your, um, to your project? Okay. Um, so that'll be an awesome workshop. So 325 and 41. Um, you've all connected with your interns. Um, hopefully at this point, I, a couple of te teams maybe have not quite, but today I think there's one more connection we'll make. Um, so the interns are here to help you, um, to do market research for you, to help you understand um, various aspects of your, your technology development that, you know, that relate to commercialization that you may not be as familiar with. Um, and uh, so if you haven't connected yet, we'll make sure that happens today. They are actually doing a lot of research, such as market, total, access, total accessible market size and things like that. And they're going to be capturing all of this information in a technology assessment and commercial feasibility document, something like that. And they'll actually be delivering this to you. And so a lot of the content you can use to, to fill in your full controls for the parts that you, know, you don't already know. And then just a reminder, you know, all of these workshops are planned to help you build your field proposal, which is due on April 8th. So that last workshop is on the first on the killer experiment, and that's just like, what activities are you going to actually be doing under funding? Um, okay, and then, so you'll have the tech assessments, you'll have completed the workshops on the first of April, you'll have the tech assessments delivered to you by March 27th, and then your final proposals are due on the 8th. Um, so those are just some um, upcoming things. So today's workshop is on um, regulatory pathway and reimbursement strategies, and I have um, two consultants um, that I brought in for this, uh, Jack and Judy, and I'll have them say a little bit about their background, but they both have long experience um, in industry and in their respective areas. The way we're gonna run the workshop today, um, you know, we're finding that the more interactive they are, the better. Um, so Jack is going to give an overview of the regulatory um, uh, environment, and then Judy's going to talk about reimbursement. Um, I think Judy's going to be talking a little bit longer. That's a relatively complicated and hard to figure out thing. Um, so they both have um, slides and some other documents that they want to show. So we'll have them speak, and then we're going to talk about your projects. Uh, what I had the interns do is make um, cheat sheets for each project, and so, and these have been provided sort of ahead of time <laughs> to Jack and Judy, and it's really because um, they're coming in cold and they haven't read your pre-proposal, so it's, what's the problem you're trying to solve, um, what is your technology solution, what's your market, and then, you know, what you think your, your regulatory classification is and what you think your reimbursement potential is. And so the interns have made little little cheat sheets for this so either I don't some of them may have sent them to you or um, or your intern may just have them um, but either way the idea would be to just stand up and just you know uh, read those few points off so that they know what the project is and then they can say oh that's a class 2 medical device and this is what you're going to need to do to get to reimbursed okay just a kind of um, reminder, and then I think what you'll find is everybody will start to learn um, how things get classified by looking at these real life examples. Okay, so that is the plan, and um, so Jack, would you like to just say a couple of words about your background and your involvement with USC, and then I'll have Judy do, sure. do that, and then we can go. Thank you for being here. I enjoy being at USC. I teach a class at the health campuses 
I've had to teach one of their classes, and that's really cool. So my background basically is business development to marketing introduction. So I've done a lot of business analysis. I'm engineer by education, by degree. I have a couple of my degrees in engineering. I have an MBA. MBA really allowed me to go a little bit wider. I was able to cast my net wider. And regulatory, let me come right to the regulatory. I wish things were as nice as you say. Oh, any, any month, there you go. I know that's a class one. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, that's a class two. Things are not that simple. Okay, sorry, I'm just stating what reality is. So my job is to bring to your attention what are some of the challenges you're going to be facing. Maybe you don't, maybe you do. Okay, maybe one out of the, most of the project you may, you may have a question. But good news, most of you are going in the good, right direction. My first read, I just did a first read, that's all. Of the cheat sheet, as you call it. Mm -hmm. So shall I go? Well, let, why don't we, um Oh, Judy, do you want to just say a little bit about your background? And Hi, everybody. I'm Judy Rosenblum. I have my own company, JR Associates. We focus on reimbursement uh, for all different types of medical technologies. Our goal is to help startup companies with innovative technologies, bringing from the beginning of strategy, from the regulatory pathway. We don't do regulatory, but we work with it, um, with people who do. Um, from Right at the time, we like to have, at the time you have the idea for the technology, we want to be brought in right at that very beginning, all the way through your regulatory process, all the way through when it's time for commercialization. There's a whole process that we'll get involved with and we'll understand plus implementation. So we come in and out of projects and for the whole life cycle of, um, of the technology bringing it forth. Um, just to give you just a little bit of background, I started as the clerk in the emergency room asking for the insurance card when everybody's doing it. So I have a pretty tough skin and I learned about insurance early on. So we have this big, broad background of this insurance and we'll see where it takes us today. Okay, so um, Jack, if you want to go into it, and um, just so you know, you're absolutely right. We actually have a couple of teams in our funding portfolio right now, but we still have a lot of regular funds. And that's fine. You always win. You'll see, see what I mean with that. Okay. okay. I got the name correct, right? College Commercialization. Coulter College Commercialization. Innovation. Important word, innovation. Yes. Okay. I was just guessing. Okay, great. Right. Next slide, please. There you go. Okay, <laughs> just next, please. Let me go one at a time. Okay, so this is... Uh, drug device, I want to make sure that we all are on the same page. What is a drug, what's a device? Sometimes they're interchangeable. So we'll not go into much depth, but I'll give you the definition. Next, please. How many have been to FDA's website? Oh, I love it. That's great. For those that didn't raise your hands, no problem. There is, I'll, I'll give you the, some of the URL information. And they have made it much easier to navigate through about six months or four months ago. It's really cool. <coughs> Very good. Okay, next please. Sorry, okay. Sorry, that window's on there. All right, that's, that's all right. As long as you can see. So FD is changing the landscape. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on that. Next please and device regulation and classifications. I'll give a brief summary. And Q&A. Q&A probably will be rest of the conversation. Okay, next, please. I'm gonna close that. I just keep going sequence, you're doing fine. I just wanted to close that window. Okay, okay. as you wish. Oh, now you want me to go to the Word document? Uh, yeah, let's, let's go to the Word document. We gotta know what FDA's definition is. Okay. This one, I couldn't fit that in PowerPoint, therefore I put the Word document. Okay. There you go, thanks. Can everybody read that? Not gonna read the whole thing. Just highlighted some areas here. Um, let me just see that. That way I'm not obstructing you. Okay. 
So, yellow, let me, let me tell you what is not there. The key phrase is it must act through metabolism. Whatever product is being injected in the body or taken or whatever, it's affected by metabolism. And if you're metabolizing that, and if that's effectiveness, it's a drug, okay? Otherwise, it's a device. Let us talk about device. There you go, thank you. The key part of the device is as follows. It's intended for use in the diagnosis of disease or other conditions, or in the cure, mitigation, treatment, and prevention of disease in man or animals. This is going to be very important because many of you are going to be going through the app, uh, you know, apps. And it's very easy to say, well, it's not a device. It's, uh, you know, it's just information. Be careful what we claim, okay? So it's an intended use and the claims that will determine are we really doing diagnostic information? Would this information be used to diagnose a problem? If it is, it kind of goes into device arena. So you want to know that up front, okay? That is a fine line you can play with. Not quite claim, don't go that far, but still have it do it, the job you want it to do. But don't claim that. Nobody can just read that, oh, that's a diagnosing problem. How come you're not claiming it? Because FDA is not stupid. Okay, next please. Now we go back to the, the PowerPoint. PowerPoint, please. Uh, would these be available to the students? To the, I didn't mean students. To mm -hmm. the yes, class. Yes, we can do that. Yes. Okay. If you want, it still be available. There's nothing that's proprietary. Okay. Navigating a website. Okay. That's the website fda.gov slash cdrh. CDRH is for medical devices. Center of Disease Radiological Health. That's medical devices. You also have the drugs and biologics. I didn't bother putting it there. To make it easier, what I have done, and we're not going to go through each item, I have given the URLs, the important URLs, so you don't have to navigate. You just click on the silly thing, and it'll take you which, where you want to go. Let's just take a couple examples. For example, if you want a product code, product code is one of the most important things. It's a three-letter code, like ABC. And that code pretty much guide your information, okay? So there's the I, I just clicked it, so. No, it's all right, don't, don't worry about it. Okay, so there's product codes, what's the device, and you don't need to fill all the information out when you're doing search. What I've discovered is the more you put there, the more confusing it gets because if there's information that is confusing, it doesn't know which one did you mean. I put the minimum, that's my style. Put the minimum, it doesn't work, that I, I feed the monster a little at a time, okay? And I, product code is important. If you've got the product code, it'll be very easy, okay? Let's go back to the link, please. No, we're doing fine. No, you, mean you want us to, um, Yeah, let's scroll that up a little bit. No, no, no. Okay, I'm not going to go through each. You want to go to the PowerPoint? No, not yet. Okay. I know you're anticipating me. Let's go back to the link. I, I didn't make that, the list of the links. Okay. I just want them to have a feel of what kind of links I'm providing. Okay. So there's the regulations. There's classification. How do you know what the classifications are? When you push that link, push the link, it tell you. So you don't have to navigate through to find for yourself. It's all here. Let's five take the notification. Uh, let's come down some more, please. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. Okay. So there are, you will see in the next slide, there are some reserved devices. Well, which one is reserved? And where is the list of reserved devices? And it makes it easy. They list all the reserved devices. So you can figure out if your product is reserved class. Okay? And when is the device not a device? Okay? 
if it does not do what we talked about, then it's not a device. For example, you're providing information for somebody's exercise routine. Are they on track? Are they not on track? That's not a device. That's not used for diagnosis. Is it useful? Yeah. Is it helpful? Yes. But MD does not have anything to do with that. All right? Make sense? OK. Uh, PowerPoint, please. That's about a three-page document. And I'm sure Christine or Tamara will make it up to you guys. OK. And next, next. All right. Let's spend a few minutes here. A few weeks ago, I was at the LA district where we have a new director. It's an interim director, but he will be one. And he advised us that commissioner has quit, so there's going to be a new commissioner. I think they're figuring out who the new commissioner will be. And other top aides, they're all in transition. So it's a little bit of a, they don't know what's going on. It likely affect the entire organization. They're redoing how FD is organized. So the way things have been done for the last 20, 30 years, they don't want it anymore. We don't know what, how it's going to be. Just that, you know, there's a lot of change in the, in the air. The likely will affect the entire organization. For example, with, thank you, with, White House, political pressures, public perception that FD has to worry about, and let me just spend a minute here. FD really is in a rock and a hard spot. Okay? They depend on Congress for money, but Congress has their own agenda. Public has an agenda of 100% safety. With a show of hands, can everything be 100% safe? If you really believe that, raise your hand. Nothing in life is 100%. So out of a million devices, this device doesn't work. Somebody gets hurt. The public will get on the web and complain. FDA, how could you let, allow that device to go out? Didn't you know any better? That's kind of stuff FDA has to deal with. So when you're working with FDA, realize there's somebody, not a pen-headed monster, Somebody there who's got those pressures. I just wanted you to be aware of that. Tactics. Policies are going to change. That will determine the tactics. We don't know what they are. And so what now? What do you do? Well, we can't wait for them to get everything figured out. So we just keep going, and hopefully things will work out. <coughs> For example, there are pending submissions. And people really have concerns about it. They still do. What do you do with the pending submission? Rules may change. What was good yesterday may not be good today. That's been going on for the last three years. What was good previously? Let's say 510K took six months to complete or three months to complete. You do the same application, similar stuff, not anymore. They change the rules. So roots are constantly changing. It's evolving. FDA is evolving. So FDA is not cast in concrete. The regulations may be the same, but the interpretation of that is different. All right? They're adding a lot of extra stuff because it's good for you. Sorry to give me that. And for risk, risk analysis, it's never been a requirement in writing. There's only one place, one place where it says you're going to have to do risk analysis before you take the product into the patient. There's only one place. Now they want to do risk management. Where are you doing it? How are you following it? So these are very important things to know. The more you know, the more opportunity you have to address it when it happens. Okay? Whether you put that in submission or not, I'm not going to stand here and tell you because it's a judgment call. Why? The more you put in submission, the more opportunity of their questions. Okay. So from my experience, what I do is I put reasonably minimum, but I have everything 
than in my hip pocket. So if somebody asks a question, I get an email the very next day. So they have the answer, okay? All right, so as I was saying, uh, answer, there's nothing new here. The potential magnitude is going to be. Okay? It's a little bad news, but just know which, what's going on. The wind, the political wind is changing. Next, please. Okay, classifications. Concerned about my neck. I just don't <laughs> like people have my back. To us, to us. Wonderful people. Okay, so classification depends upon intended use. Everybody knows what intended use is, yes? Let's not go any farther. Everybody knows what an intended use is. You got to be clear on what that is. You may spend a couple of days on figuring out in the teens. What is the intended use? And only down to exactly who's the target, who's the target population, and what exactly is that going to do? That's intended use. And risk. Through risk analysis, you figure out how risky is the product. Those two things will determine what? Is it a class one, class two, or class three? Okay? And risk also gets in involved. Class one is the easiest. It's essentially self-regulation. You don't have to make a submission. You just get a, a registration for your site. So the site is registered. Kind of big deal. A couple of days, maybe a couple hundred hours. Oh, yeah. And the only concern you would have is First, there's no submission required. Everybody got that. There are exempt devices, and that's a good thing. That means you don't have to file a 510K. You're exempt. No submission required. On the other hand, you're non-exempt, meaning you've got to file a 510K. For example, uh, let me not give you the examples. Okay, class two. Most of the products you folks are gonna come up with, most of them, and this statement is true, 95% of the submission that FDA gets are 510 It's easy submission because you're demonstrating equivalence. It's equivalent to something that is out there already being sold. So my job is to make it look like that so my indication views are similar. So if I have some unique uses for the product, I can't be using 510K because their product works on, on children, and mine works on old people. Now, it's a different, different uh, intention. So you gotta be careful on how you demonstrate equivalence. It's gotta be like, like for like. Make it fuzzy a little bit. All right, classification code is the key. We talked about that, a three-letter code. That three-letter code, once you have that, it tells you what you have to do. It gives you all the hoops you have to go through, all the tests you have to do, okay? It also makes it easier for you to figure out who is out there selling the product, because that code will lead you to their factor K numbers, okay? Um, I don't want to go on this detail. Class three. Oh, um, less than 20% of the devices require for the 510K clinical data, okay? There's gotcha here. FDA won't tell you they want clinical data until you make a submission, give all the data, and they say, oh, you know, it would be nice to have some clinical data. Right behind the eight ball. I've been there. Because regulation doesn't tell me that. Some regs do on some devices. We know that. So I knew up front, so I got in the, through IDE. Everybody knows what IDE is? Yes? Okay, investigational device exemption. So 
So it's almost like if a product, how you can put product on a human being if it's approved for sale. So it has a label. So that's, I can sell it. Well, these devices are experimental. So by definition, they're not approved for sale. Therefore, I have to get an IDE for investigation device exception. Typical number of patients about 30 to 50 for medical devices for submissions of patent. So IDE is uh, something that, regardless of class, you need an IDE for any pre approved. Use. Okay, this is good. Only those devices that require clinical data. Before I can go to clinic, I gotta have an ID. FDA stamp clearly saying, yep, they're telling me I can go to 20 patients, 30 patients, 40 patients, whatever. With this approved, approved meaning they have reviewed the product literature, they reviewed the safety data, they reviewed your manufacturing process, they know nobody's going to get hurt. Jack, or, could you comment on significant risk versus non-significant risk devices and the role of the IRB versus the FDA in sure. management of the I'll, I'll get into that. Significant risk devices require IDE. Because remember, risk determines what you're going to do. So if the procedure makes a device significant risk, then that procedure requires IDE. If it's a non-significant risk, you don't need to have an IDE. You can directly go through an IRB in the clinics. So this clinical approval, thank you very much. And I didn't need to get into the detail, but I'd be happy to answer your question. Yeah, that, that would be important for some of the teams. Absolutely. Some of them might be doing clinical testing, so they're going to need to feel know. Feel free. Talk, talk to me. I mean, you're right. Right. no problem. Would you have a question? No, I mean, so let's go back to hers, which was the difference between significant risk and non-significant risk, and, right. and, and then how that inter links up to your less than 20% required clinical data. Okay, now hang on, hang on. Less than 40% applications require clinical data. Whether it's significant or not significant is not the question. Okay. Okay? If you need clinical data, you need clinical data. If it's significant risk, you gotta go through FD first. If it's not significant risk, FD is bypassed. So then let's talk about, so you say you either need clinical data or you don't need clinical data, FDA won't tell you. So now, put they in team. They, they won't tell you that up front. Right, so how would a team that has a new product or new technology I, pass it to I wish I could tell you. Okay. Well, because we'll ask Jack. That's because what I, yeah. Well, yeah. Hang on, hang on. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to lie. Yeah, I don't I want to say, I know everything. No, yeah. I don't. Sure. I got blindsided too. And actually I was working with a partner and I could hear, you see, you can hear things between lines. That, oh my gosh, that's they want clinical data. <laughs> and Jane says, no, they didn't ask for it. It doesn't require it. I said, Jane, I didn't need to give her a name. Mm. Jane, I'm telling you. And after six, three months, sure enough, you know, that would be nice to have the clinical data. Well, why the hell did you tell me that up front? But you cannot tell. So you have to almost recognize what's, what's going on. For example, I saw one of the applications was something about ba uh, babies, Some, uh, something about the sweat. Yeah, the cystic. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. OK, I cannot tell you standing here. But I just look at it, my first reaction, oh my gosh. I don't know if the other, there are the other products there like that. If there are, you don't have to go PMA route, you can go 510K route. Everybody with me? You've got a product where you have an application, where you have a method, you have a testing. Your product does something. Diagnostic testing. Diagnostic testing. So maybe there's another product out there. So if there's another product, you can piggyback to that. And you can say, okay, mine is like that. My indication is like that. Therefore, I can do 510K. Don't necessarily have to go PMA. However, if it's a big however, depending on the risk, six months ago, six years ago, 6,000 years ago, they may have given somebody 510K. Doesn't mean anything. Just because somebody got a 510K, they have indication, you can make all the case, you can turn blue, turn, hold your breath until you turn blue. 
to help me. You have to use common sense. And here's here's what I'm saying. I'm lecturing here a little bit. If you're FDA, what you're concerned about, whatever this procedure is, is there a risk to the baby involved? If the decision whether you treat the baby or not depends on this test, then there was a whole do. Uh, I better get some data. So even if somebody didn't do the testing before, you better think about it. And if you talk it over, like do we really want to have the data available? When you say clinical data, there is a difference between uh, what I'm doing now with the pilot plan, for example, and what the physical data that is available in the field. That's my statement now. And then there is a validation process of clinical data. What are you determining exactly on the, that process? What do you think? That's a good question. Validation. Sorry? Validation. Validation. So it's a bigger, the bigger trials to prove that. Well, it's a submission. The is doing I thought the whole, my whole purpose of standing here is talking about submissions. We're not talking about proving the concept in a laboratory. I can talk about it, but the class, the conversation is about regulatory. FDA does not regulate your pilot study as long as there's a human being involved. That's why you do animal studies, okay? Preclinical is almost a requirement before you go to the FDA with the I or IDE. They will always ask you, okay, great. Have you done any animal testing? And, oh God, this is gonna take a minute. It's important. There are two different animal tests involved. Okay, please listen this up. There's biological testing to demonstrate that a product is biocompatible. It's ISO 10993. The list is probably like 20, 20 different tests involved. And each test has different ways. Some tests require animals' involvement. That's not the animal testing we are talking about. We are talking about have an animal model that mimics, that duplicates the efficacy of what you're doing here. I work with heart quite a bit. So for heart, you really got to get into pigs, got to get into dogs, very large animals. Okay, I can't be using a rat. I've done a lot of work with rats. Rats are great for testing, cheap, okay? Or rabbits. So the point I'm making is animal testing will be required before we go to the human testing. That is part of demonstrating that you believe that the product is safe and it will work on people. And to validate that, to prove that it works on people, you need clinical trials. So this 20% is for those products that require clinical data, for those that are significant risk, and there's some debatable on that, so it's significant risk, go into through ID application. So just to yeah. clarify, yeah. like some of the teams, for example, Danielle, she's already doing clinical studies. There are no preclinical models and she just goes right, right to humans. Hers is... Yeah, because some drug, new drugs even are approved without animal data necessarily. I mean, they go... I'm talking about devices. Concept. I'm talking about devices, folks. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about drugs. Okay, sorry. Mike, the, this whole slide, presentation is about devices. For drugs, your uh, IVD, is that a drug or is that a device? No, no, for the, what I'm doing, it's a, it's a device. But Correct. It, there was no animal data. There was pilot studies with human subjects. Before. Okay, and if all you need is somebody's, you don't have to be invasive, maybe you don't need animal data. Okay, so it's not a prerequisite. It's yeah. depending on the situation. I depend. Everything's depends on the situation. What would happen is that. if the IRB thought it was risky, mm -hmm. they they may not want to give approval for your clinical protocol without animal data, for example. Well, sure. IRB will look at the same thing FDA looks at. Okay, or things that require animal testing. It becomes obvious. Well, you've got to have some animal work done. Then you got to do it. Whether it goes to FD or whether it goes to IRP, it doesn't matter. Make sense? Oh, yes, it depends on the risk. It depends on the risk and what you're doing. So each situation is unique, and I can't be standing here and telling you oh, that's easy, just, just do this or do that. You don't know. You have to get into it. 
Is it possible that sometimes the animal studies are not relevant? Humans, in other words, they're so far off from human data that it's I, I would not spend a lot of money on those studies. Yeah, I don't believe in doing anything that is irrelevant. As a, I'm just telling you, I just won't do it. It looks good, but I won't do it. For one thing, you do a study and it fades, and now what? I get an egg on my face. It delays me, so I won't do that. It has to be relevant, otherwise, why did you do that? It has to make sense. I hope I'm not joking about it, but I'm serious. You gotta take a look. Okay, some things here. Design controls are required. I didn't have enough space for class two, as well as class three products. PMA, pre-market approval. Notice the word approval? I put that in highlight. Okay, this is the only thing MP approves on devices. They don't approve 510Ks. So what happens to the 510K? Uh, notification. You notify FDA and not an approval. So people make this is an elementary mistake. Don't do that. Okay. It really gets people upset. FDA gets very mad if you're paying that you have approved product. They will literally shut you down. I've known companies that are out of business. But they have to change the labels so they cannot afford it. 510K is a notification. And when you get a 510K number, everybody knows what a 510K number is? No? Okay. Starts with a K, letter K, and then it's, a, I believe, six digit. First two digits tell you the year. Year in which it was, it was given because you had a notification. And then there's a unique number. What's the point I'm making? Uh, I cannot even put that number on my label. I cannot claim. I got a 510K. No. We just sell it. And that's where a lot of companies are getting into trouble. Have you been uh, watching the news or being aware? Uh, for the SAP, some work on the esophagus, there is code that goes in there. Okay? People are dying because of bacteria that is resistant, you're not even egg. Great. That device was not approved. Who's going to know? So you could be using an unapproved device or an approved device, approved meaning pre market, uh, what's that called? Uh, notified. The notification is there, but eh, they didn't put the number, because they can't put the number. I'm just telling you why it's very important to know exactly what you're doing, what you can do, and what you cannot do. Even if you have um, notification from the FDA, FDA gives you a letter. Uh, you can send the product. Good. We're going to keep it on your time. OK. Uh, just my last slide, please. Oh, oh, Q and A. <laughs> okay. Okay, we can take a couple questions. I think there'll be more you know, when we go through the sure. project. We'll work. But if you have questions, can you please go back to the previous slide. Sure. <coughs> I think classification of class two and three is based on the risk, not just by thinking or PMA. Is that correct? I mean, there could be some devices that are class two. Yes. But there is nothing comparable to that device, if it's a no new hope. device, then they need to get PMA, is that part of it? De novo, right? De novo process, and again, that's another another depth of this information that I didn't talk about. But there's a product that I believe is a 510K product, because it's not highly risky, but I cannot make equivalence claim to anybody. So I'm kind of in the twilight zone. What do I do? So. I approach FDA and I said, would you please classify this as what? So the question comes out as what? So the novel process actually allows FDA to decide if it's going to be 510K or a PMA. You could do that through a, a, a 510K application. While they're reviewing the application, they could decide if it's a PMA. 
if it's a PMA, then you gotta do XO. Oh, oops, sorry. It's all right, XO. I know you try to kick me out, no problem. <laughs> Does that kind of answer your question? Um, I mean, if there is no, I mean, in 510K, you need to have the credit credit device. Yeah, absolutely. If there is none, then how can you solve it? Then it's called it, okay. You can go ahead and roll the dice and make it a PMA. Companies do that for, for marketing reason. If I go ahead and have this device and I say, okay, I'm going to go for a PMA, and Joe Blow comes down behind me and has another device like this, I just made him or her having to do PMA. So these are tricks you can play once you know how the game is played. How much money you have, how much market there is, and how much you want to keep the competition out. You can do that too. So these are the choices you're going to make as time goes on. Whether it's a class three or class two, if it's not clear, uh-oh, you're in a twilight zone. You sit down together and meet and decide. Okay, I think my time is up, folks. Yeah, one quick question. Um, can you talk a little bit briefly about, uh, so some people who live in this room have technologies that may be enabled by, by an uh, approved device, right? But they are not going to go through the FCA process themselves. So if you can imagine a component or something that's uh, an algorithm or processing thing. So what are the things that teams that are doing technology development, are there, are there things that they should be sensitive to or be aware of? If they know that ultimately will be included in a, reg in a regulated product, but they're not going to go down that path. Excellent. Did everybody hear the question? Very good question. It's useful. I would answer it. I'd like to answer it. It's similar to what you're talking about. Pilot. You're doing something to make sure that the idea works. But you're not worried about FDA at that time. It's R&D. Okay? R&D stuff stays in the R&D lab notebook. Essentially, I've done that. And FDA doesn't, oops, there's design control. It's not a design control element because it's not a project yet. Mm -hmm. You can do that. <coughs> know that, is there a drug that you're developing? Is there a device you're developing? Because if it's a drug, your client is going to be a big company where they got a lot of money. Probably take 10 years to get drug approved in, in America. Okay, if it's a device, and you have an idea, you got a gut feel, you probably want to know, is that a 510K or a PMA? Why? 510K is about a six month to 10 month, nine month process. So you have an idea, what, who you can approach, you're gonna sell it to somebody. However, if it's a PMA, the little guys are out of the picture. Now you're talking about big companies. So you're gonna know who you're, who you're gonna target, you're targeting, Bigger company who's got a lot of money, who it takes about three to five years in my opinion. Does that make sense? Okay.